Hey everybody, this video is on de Broglie's matter wave hypothesis. In the year 1923, de Broglie proposed the idea that matter, such as particles, can display wave behaviors and be wave in nature. Prior to this, the concepts of matter and wave are understood as separate subjects in the field of physics. De Broglie proposed that the wavelength of a matter wave is given by Planck's constant h divided by the momentum of the particle, which is in turn given by its mass multiplied by its velocity. This concept of matter-wave duality was already alluded to by Einstein in his quantum model of light involving the concept of photons. In this model, light can be thought of as individual massless particles with the energy of each photon given by the equation of E equals hf, Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency of light. The massless property of photons can be accounted for by de Broglie's equation as the mass of photons becomes negligible and tends towards zero when the particle's velocity approaches the speed of light, which is c. When de Broglie made this hypothesis regarding matter-wave duality, he also applied the concept of matter waves to electrons in atoms, and this will be the focus of this video. De Broglie stated that electrons orbit the nucleus as standing waves, and that the circumference of the electronic orbits is quantized. A standing wave is formed when two waves of equal amplitude and frequency are propagating in the opposite direction, shown by the blue and red waves. When they propagate in such a direction, they will interfere in such a way to produce a wave that only oscillates on the spot, and this is shown by the black standing wave. It is useful to know that the position at which there is no oscillation is known as the nodes of the standing wave, and positions at which there is maximum displacement of oscillation, that in other words, where the amplitudes occur, these are known as the antinodes of the standing wave. De Broglie explained that atomic electrons should be understood as standing waves around the orbit rather than as particles. So imagine that the black standing wave wraps around the circular orbit that was described by Niels Bohr in his atomic model. In order for a standing wave to be formed around an electronic orbit, the wavelength of an electron must be specific such that an integral multiple of the wavelengths can fit inside the circumference of the orbit. The word integral means a whole number multiple of the wavelength. So this can be 1 lambda, 2 lambda, 3 lambda, and so on. In this diagram, we have exactly two multiples of wavelengths that's being fitted inside the circumference of the orbit. This requirement explains the quantization of energy of electronic orbits previously postulated by Bohr in his atomic model. The quantized nature of an orbit in simpler words means that its circumference must be an integral multiple of the wavelength of the electron as we previously explained. Specifically, the circumference of the orbit given by the expression of 2 pi r, where r is the radius of the orbit, is equal to n times by lambda where n is an integer, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Here, n also corresponds to the energy state outlined in Bohr's model. n equals 1 corresponds to the first orbit, where the circumference of the first orbit, so 2 pi r1, equals to exactly one multiple of the wavelength of the electron. The second orbit corresponds to n value of 2. This means 2 pi r2 is equal to two multiples of the wavelength. And finally, the third orbit, which corresponds to a value of n equals to 3, is a multiple of 3 of the wavelength of the electron. It's important for there to be an integral multiple of a wavelength in the orbit, because otherwise, the interference of the electron waves will not result in a standing wave, such as what's shown by this diagram. The Broglie's matter wave hypothesis overcomes the limitations of the Bohr atomic model. Firstly, the wave nature of electrons as standing waves explains the stability of its orbits. When electrons orbit the nucleus as a wave, they do not lose energy in the form of radiation, and therefore they are able to maintain their orbit without spiraling into the nucleus. Secondly, de Broglie's equations explain the quantization of electrons' angular momentum, which was the third postulate of Bohr's model. If we combine de Broglie's equation with the quantization of the circumference of the orbits, so if we substitute the wavelength lambda from the two equations, we get 2 pi r equals to nh over mv. When we multiply 
mv on both sides and divide 2 pi on both sides, we'll get mvr equals to nh over 2 pi. We know that mv is the momentum of a particle, mvr is the expression for the angular momentum of the electron, which is also sometimes written as capital L. So the angular momentum in this equation is equal to n, which is an integer, so n can be 1, 2, or 3, and so on, times by h, which is Planck's constant, divided by 2 pi, which is also a constant. This expression explains that the angular momentum of the electron is a multiple of Planck's constant divided by 2 times by pi. So therefore, it supports Bohr's third postulate in his model of the atom. In summary, the Broglie's matter wave hypothesis provides a different understanding of the nature of electrons in atoms. And more broadly speaking, it also provides a different understanding of moving matter and waves in general, not just electrons. While this hypothesis at the time accounted for the limitations of Bohr's model, it lacked scientific and experimental evidence. There are three main pieces of evidence supporting the Broglie's matter wave duality theory. The first is Davison Gurman's nickel crystal experiment, second is a double slit experiment using electrons, and third is a gold foil experiment using electrons. The nickel crystal experiment took place after de Broglie's matter wave hypothesis. Davison and Germer were using electrons to investigate the lattice structure of nickel crystal. In this experiment, electrons were accelerated by a potential difference and further fired at the nickel crystal that was to be investigated. In this case, the potential difference did work on the electrons according to work equals Q times by V. And as a result, the work done was transformed into the kinetic energy of the electrons. So we can use this to find the velocity of the electrons. In other words, the velocity of the electrons that were fired at the nickel crystal depended on the voltage that was used to accelerate them in the first place. When the electrons reached the nickel crystal, they were scattered and they produced band patterns that were similar to those in the double slit diffraction experiment involving lights. Specifically, Davison and Germer observed that there was a first order maximum, that is mx01, forming at roughly 50 degrees relative to the midline where the electrons were reaching the nickel crystal. Remember this angle for now as this will become important later on. Davison and Germer, after noticing the diffraction pattern, they used the equation for diffraction, which is d sine theta equals to m lambda, to calculate the experimental value for the wavelength of electrons. When electrons reached the nickel crystal, they underwent diffraction because the distance between the atoms of the nickel was so small that they effectively acted as a small aperture, causing diffraction. Therefore, the variable d in this equation is referring to the distance between the atoms of nickel. The variable theta is the angle at which the maximum was formed. In our case, when m, which is the order, was 1, the angle was 50 degrees, which is what they observed. By putting these numbers in, distance between the atoms of nickel and 50 degrees, which was the angle at which the first maximum was observed, Davison and Germer calculated the wavelength of electrons, which was 1.65 Armstrong. 1 Armstrong is equal to 1 times 10 to minus 10 meters. So therefore, 1.65 Armstrong is 1.65 times 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. After they calculated the experimental value of lambda, they also used de Broglie's equation on matter wave duality to calculate the theoretical value of electron's wavelength. This is done by using Planck's constant, the mass of the electrons, and the velocity of the electron that we discussed earlier. Remember that the velocity of these electrons was determined by the voltage that was used to accelerate them in the first place. I want you to notice that the theoretical wavelength that was calculated is very similar to the experimental value that the two scientists determined. Because the values are so close, this shows that de Broglie's equation is accurate, and as such, Davison and Germer's experiment provided evidence for de Broglie's matter wave duality theory. Following Davison and Germer's nickel crystal experiment, Various other experiments were conducted to verify the wave nature of electrons. In one experiment, electrons were fired at two narrow slits that were separated by a small distance. In other words, a double slit experiment involving electrons rather than lights. When electrons passed through the two slits, they formed 
a band-like pattern on the screen, which was similar to what we would see when waves pass through the same diffraction apparatus. As a result, this experiment supports the wave behavior or nature of electrons. Similarly, when electrons were beamed at the thin gold foil, a diffraction and interference pattern was also observed. You can see that in the center there's a bright spot separated by concentric or circular black spaces denoting the presence of minimum points where there's destruct interference between electrons. After the concentric dark spot, there's another bright ring around it. This is the first maximum point corresponding to construct interference. This observation also supports the wave behavior and nature of electrons. Let's have a look at how we can use de Broglie's matter wave equation. Calculate the de Broglie wavelength for a proton traveling at 0.15 c. We know that de Broglie's wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the proton. So Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 divided by mass of the proton is approximately 1.673 times 10 to the power of minus 27. And the velocity here is given by the question. So 0.15 c, 0.15 multiplied by 3 times 10 to the power of 8, which is the speed of light. This gives a wavelength of 8.8 .8 .8 times 10 to the power of minus 15 meters. This concludes the video on de Broglie matter wave duality.